ice as far as the eye can see, hurricane force winds, and flesh freezing temperatures. Well, for explorer Sebastian Copeland, it's all in a day's work. He has reached both poles, opened new routes across the ice, and holds the world record for crossing the Greenland ice sheet with skis and kites. The award-winning photographer and filmmaker capturing his adventures in a brand new book called Arctica, The Vanishing North. They are stunning images, but they also tell the story of a changing climate. Your focus is North Pole. So why all of these efforts in this one place? Well, I've done quite a large amount of travel in the Arctic, in Antarctica as well, but the, uh, the North Pole is really ground zero for climate change. And uh, uh, it is, it remains probably the harshest environment to travel in in the world. In my opinion, the trip to the North Pole is the most difficult expedition in the world. Sure, you could be naked up Everest and that probably would be more difficult, <laughs> but pound for pound, most explorers would agree that that's the gold standard. But it's also the most viscerally, clearly identifiable way of seeing climate change as it happens. Because the Arctic Ocean is exactly that. It's an ocean covered with a thin crust of ice, as opposed to Antarctica, which is actually a continent surrounded by ocean. Yeah. But the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by continents, and that thin crust of ice is, is uh, very susceptible to minor changes in climate and temperatures. And, uh, and you can almost literally see and hear it disappear before you. Describe to me what that's like to stand there because we think of it as all you're going to hear is a howling wind Think of it as this sort of floating area of ice that moves around and as it moves it cracks open into what we call open leads and then it comes together into what are uh, pressure ridges, these big walls of ice that crumble together. And so you have these billions of pounds of ice crushing together and creating this grinding sound. It's quite unique. That's amazing. Well, this pressure ridge is being form just as we speak, just the forces of nature, just the tides crumbling, these massive pieces of ice. So let's, let's talk about why you put the book together and how long it took you to do that. The book is the accumulation of about 10 years of travel, intense travel deep into the, uh, the, the, uh, the Arctic North. It is a uh, very, very varied environment. Most people think of the ice as just this sort of monochromatic sure. dead desert, if you will. In fact, it's a vibrant ecosystem filled with uh, all types of its own indigenous life uh, forms, of course, you know, the mammals and the fish, and uh, as well as uh, the moss and all those different things. So it actually gives you a fairly rich palette of colors with dominance of blues and greens, of course, because it tends to be what the water defines most. Let's go through some of the images that, that I saw that I thought were just incredible. One of them is a decaying polar bear. All animal form dies in the Arctic, of course, but you don't generally come across a uh, decomposing carcass of a polar bear. There are many, many instances of polar bears not making uh, the summer melt period, which is the lean months for them. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll shed up to 40% of their body weight in the summer months. And over the course of the last few decades, and especially at an accelerated rate now, we're losing more and more of the winter freeze, extending the lean months. I mean, essentially, a bear hunts on the sea ice. It looks for seal breathe holes, and then they wait by the holes, and when the seals come up, they pounce on them, pull them out, and gorge on them. In the summer, the sea ice melts, breaks down, seals have a lot more areas to come out, and it's much more difficult, come impossible for a bear to catch a seal. Uh, I'm out here by myself. I've got a, uh, a flare. In fact, I've got two of them in case of an unfortunate encounter with a bear, but they haven't seen bears here uh, in the last year, and they've seen only two in the last two years, so there's bids in my favor. That's powerful. Another image that I really thought was so well captured was a tent buried in the snow. I was crossing Greenland from south to north, and we got trapped in a seven consecutive day hurricane there with 80 plus mile an hour winds. And it's, uh, that's pretty bewildering uh, because you realize you've got a thin layer of nylon separating you from impending death. With any luck, the tent will hold up. Hopefully this will uh, blow over and we can get back on our journey. These winds just battering the, uh, the tent. Um, and it's just literally like sitting inside a jet engine turbine inside the tent because you've got this really wild sound happening outside the tent, shaking in all directions. But here's the, you know, the magic of human engineering. It's extraordinary to think that, uh, yeah, that tent survived and so did I. So, so taking the image was 
we made it. Yeah, if you're seeing this image, uh, it's a good sign. When you're sitting in that tent and you're getting, the tent's getting whipped around by 80 mile an hour winds, and that is hurricane force wind. Are you wondering if you're actually anchored to the ice well enough? Are you wondering if the fabric's going to hold? What's going through your mind right then? Well, very much so. In the, uh, in the first, uh, first day or so, um, you, you don't sleep soundly. You're, uh, you're quite nervous that any of that could happen. And progressively, you come to realize that it, it's holding, and um, you pull out your book and your chess game or whatever it is, and, and you wait it out. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the images that when you get a chance to look through the book or when you want to show the book to someone, you go, there, right there. That's, that's mm. a good one. I'm really partial to shooting the ice at the very onset of the, uh, the summer melt, just when the sea ice is getting quite wet, so the surface gets thawed out. And you get these big pools of water surrounding icebergs, and you get these incredible reflections, which are the result of the high mass from the salt and the high density from the cold temperature. Mm. And it gives you almost like a mirror-like reflection, which is really unique to uh, polar environments. Because as you know, the slightest ripple of wind, even a one, two knot wind, will create a little ripple over sure. water and kill the mirror. But in a very cold salt water environment, you get these fabulously reflective surfaces, and uh, those are some of my favorite. So if you had to pick the palette to tell someone the colors that live there, I think a lot of people are surprised by the blue. Yeah. So why does that color exist and give people the idea yeah. of, of what's there? Without getting too technical, the full prism of colors, red, green, and blue. Water suppresses the red value. It's only got green and blue. And water in frozen form is essentially just like looking under uh, water, if you put your hand in a pool and it looks really white, it's because the red value's been suppressed. You've only got the green and the blue and it looks like you're dead. And you come back up and you go, oh my God, oh no, there's the red is back and <laughs> I'm alive, thank God. You basically have these blocks of frozen water. And within those blocks of frozen water are no red values. You just have the blues and the green, which gives you that sort of iridescence that you're referring to. It's a color that I've never seen anywhere else. No. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, expeditions. So how many years? Let's just say, is it 15 years that you've been just doing Just about 15 now? years, yeah. Huh? In the expeditions, you actually take a number of films. You know, filming is sometimes the bane of my existence, but it is a great testament that is unmatched to words. Do you find that every time you film, it's visually changed for you what you're seeing? So does this become a catalog of time? It's definitely um, changing at the North Pole, I'll tell you that. The conditions are just much more difficult. Uh, it's a lot harder to travel at the North Pole now than it was 10 years ago, and a totally different story than what it was 30 years ago. How, what's happening? Well, it's just the condition of the ice. It's gotten thinner, um, it moves a lot more, which means it breaks a lot more and comes back together. And, and there's a lot more and a lot more pressure ridges, a lot less multi-year pans, which would be the easiest to travel on because they survive the summer melt. And they sort of get more compact and flatter and easier to travel on. Now there's less and less of that, perhaps you know, under 10% multi-year ice across the Arctic Sea, whereas it was about 80% 30 mm -hmm. years ago. We have satellites now that monitor the size of the ice, the shape of the ice, and even the depth of the ice. From your experience in standing on it, do you see it going away? There's no question that this ice is uh, going away in the summer period. We'll have ice for a very, very long time in the winter, and that's where it gets confusing for most people. Um, but the way that this affects the ice in its, um, in its construct, if you will, uh, makes it more and more challenging for people to do what I'm doing. In fact, all logistical support uh, has been canceled as of 2015. So no one wants to go and land a plane on the ice for a search and rescue mission. It's just more difficult. They've lost planes, they've damaged equipment, uh, they're putting their pilots in jeopardy, etc., etc. Uh, but my conviction is that people growing up today will not have the ability to conduct this expedition like I did. It was my childhood dream, and I know that kids growing up today will not be able to do what I'm doing today. Clearly this is an extreme journey and Copeland has had some celebrity friends that he's taken out on the ice. And there are some harrowing moments that didn't quite go as planned.